Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Mustafa Al-Bassam. He's going to talk about um, uncovering bridges by the web of sock puppet social media personas. Uh, Mustafa is a PhD student at the University College in London, um, studying information security and focusing on decentralized systems. Mustafa was a co-founder of LALSEC, a hacker activist group some of you might have heard of. Um, and with that, please give a warm applause to Mustafa. Hey, so it seems that over the past year, we've heard a lot in the media about this kind of idea that the people that you interact with on Twitter and Facebook and other kinds of social media are not, not necessarily who they say they are, and sometimes not even be, they might not even be people at all. They might be bots. And we've heard about how this can, might be used to manipulate people into believing certain things or certain ideas. And this has become quite a big topic recently, um, especially after the US presidential elections in 2016, where one, according to one study, up to one in five election-related tweets weren't actually from real people. And apparently, it's such a, it's, it's such a big problem that even the president is being manipulated by Twitter bots. But this has been a kind of activity that has been going on for a very long time, and not just from Russia or China. The West also engages in these kind of activities, including the, UK, the UK and the US, but in other, kinds of, in other regions. So today I'm going to be talking about how, what Britain does in this regard. So in the UK, we, our inter we have a NSA equivalent intelligence agency called GCHQ, or Government Communications Headquarters. And their job is basically like the, the UK's version of the NSA, to collect as, information, as much information as possible through wiretaps and mass surveillance systems. But they also have a subgroup or a sub-team within GCHQ called the Joint Threat Research Intelligence Group, or JTRIG for short. And what these guys basically do is, it's basically a fancy name for, for sitting on Twitter and Facebook all day and trolling online. What they do is they conduct what they call human intelligence, which is kind of like the act of interacting with humans online to try to make something happen in the real world. And in their own words, one of their missions is to use dirty tricks to destroy, deny, degrade, and disrupt enemies by discrediting them. And we've seen JTRIG being involved in various campaigns and operations including targeting activist groups like Anonymous and Lalsek, and also protests in the Middle East and during the Arab Spring and also the Iranian protests in 2009. So a, a bit of uh, context to what led me to, to uncover this stuff and to, to actually research this stuff. So in 2011, I was involved with the, with the, with the activist group Lalsek, and to refresh your memory, Lalsek was a group that existed during the summer of 2011 um, and hacked into a bunch of U.S. Um, corporate and government organizations like the U.S. Senate, FBI affiliates, and also Sony and Fox. And the same year, I was arrested. And a year later, I was officially indicted on a court indictment. But the thing that struck me about this indictment was that there was absolutely no mention in this court document about how they managed to de-anonymize de me and my, and my co-defendants or how they managed to actually link our online entities with our offline entities. And I thought this was suspicious because our US counterparts, um, actually, their, their court indictments had a very lengthy um, sections on how they were caught. For example, when the FBI arrested Jeremy Hammond, his court indictment had, a, had very detailed information about how the FBI sexually engineered him and managed to track him through his IP address and through Tor and whatnot. But then, fast forward a year later, um, Edward Snowden started leaking documents about the NSA and GCHQ. And then in 2014, one of those documents, or some of those documents were released on NBC that, was, that showed that GCHQ was targeting hacktivist groups like Anonymous and Lulzic. And that made the middle of sense in my head because if, if GCHQ was involved in this de-anonymization process, then they wouldn't want to have that in the court indictment because it would reveal the operational techniques. 
And this is one of the, this is one of the leaked slides from GCHQ talking about some of the hacktivist groups they target. One of the people they targeted um, was someone who went by the nickname of Perk, who was chatting in an IRC channel, a public chat network. And this was a public chat chatting channel where pe people from Anonymous and other kinds of activists kind of sit, sit and chat about various topics and also plan um, operations. And um, this person, Perk, was chatting on this channel and boasted that they had a list of 700 FBI agents, emails, and phone numbers and names. And then it turned out that a GCHG agent was covertly in this channel observing what people were saying. And then the GCHG agent initiated a private message with this, with this person to kind of get more information and to try to build a relationship with this person. And the agent asked them, what was the site? Uh, and then they, they just gave that information up, and they even uh, gave them a sample of some of the leaked information. So it turns out that actually GCHQ was active in these IRC networks and uh, chat networks for months, if not years. And they were, they were in up to several hundred channels at a time. They were just sitting there idling. They weren't really saying much or actually participating in conversation, except that every few months, you might notice them say, hey, or LOL in the chat, even though it might be out of context, the conversation that was going on, presumably so that they won't get kicked off the network, because some networks kick you off if you're idling there for too, for too long. And then often what they would do is they would private message people in rooms to try and corroborate information about activities that were going on and being discussed, or try, or try to entrap people by getting them to admit to things, as we saw with Poke. And it seemed to be quite a common theme that these undercover feds and agents were sitting in these, in these chat rooms. In the Europol meeting in um, 2011, where 15 European countries were discussing uh, what they were doing to, t to tackle anonymous and law's sake, Apparently, there were so many undercover cops in, this channel, in these channels that they had an issue with undercover cops investigating each other. So the GCHU agent that was targeting Perk um, sent, sent them a link to, some, to a BBC News article about hacktivists. And according to, to this leaked slide, this link enabled GCHQ to conduct um, signal intelligence to discover Perk's real name, Facebook, and email accounts, etc. It doesn't say exactly how they did that, but it's not that hard if they, if they have your IP address and user agent. Back then, in 2011, most websites weren't using HTTPS, including Facebook. So if they look up your IP address in XQ score or the Dragnet surveillance systems, they can easily see what other traffic uh, is originating from that IP address and what, the IP address is, what um, Facebook accounts are connected to that IP address, for example. But in this, in this slide leaked by NBC, the URL was redacted. But it wasn't very hard to actually find that URL because these were public channels that GCHU agents were talking in. And have, and people haven't been targeted in themselves, including myself, um, we were able to find out what that URL shortener was. I mean, what that, what that website was, but which turned out to be a URL shortener. So the website that was sent to Perk to click was um, lurl.me. And according to archive.org, this is a snapshot from lurl.me in 2013, uh, just before it went offline that basically showed it was a URL shortening service. Like a very, it looks like a generic URL, URL shortening service. One of the things I noticed, it actually sound, the domain name sounds like Yuromi, which is basically what, what they were doing. Because JTRIG um, had this internal wiki where they listed all of the tech tools, tools and techniques that they use in their operations. And one of the categories that they have is, a, is shaping and honeypots. And in that category, they have a tool that, they code, that is codenamed Deadpool, which is described as a URL shortening service. And that's what lurl.me was. 
LARs like me was we first saw that in 2009. It was, the domain name was registered in 2009. And almost immediately, it was, it was linked to tweets about Iranian protests. And then it went offline in 2013, shortly after the Edward Snowden leaks in November. But the interesting thing, if you look up all of the instances of this URL shortener being used in social media and Twitter, there's probably about 100, 200 instances of it being used. And every single one of those instances where it was used, it was associated with political activities related in the Middle East or Africa, usually to, 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 to protests. And the majority of them was com were coming from uh, de default Twitter accounts with no avatar, with very few tweets, and they were accounts that were active for only a few months between 2009 and 2013. One of the techniques, or some of the techniques that JTRIG use in their own words to conduct their operations is, includes uploading YouTube videos containing persuasive messaging, establishing online aliases with Facebook and Twitter accounts, blogs and forum memberships for conducting human intelligence or encouraging discussion on specific issues, sending spoof emails and text messages as well as providing pre, uh, spoof online resources and setting up spoof trade sites. And that, this is exactly what we're going to see over the next few slides. And in one of the examples that they uh, use uh, for the operations is they actually targeted the entire general population of Iran, which is a pretty big target audience of 80 million people. According to them, they had several goals in Iran. The first goal was to discredit the Iranian leadership and its nuclear program. The second goal was to delay and dis disrupt online access to materials using the nuclear program. The third goal was conducting the online human intelligence. And the fourth goal was the most interesting goal, in my opinion, counter censorship. It might, seem, it might sound great. It might sound like almost like GCHQ is kind of aligned with the motives of the internet freedom community by helping these Iranian activists to evade censorship. But we're going to see it's not really the case. The main kind of Iran, the main kind of sock puppet account on Twitter that JTRIG was running um, during this campaign in 2009 uh, was called 2000 Iran, 2009 Iran Free. This was the most kind of active Twitter account that they had, and it had 216 tweets. And they also had a kind of like a bunch of other accounts that were less active that had default avatars, probably just to kind of, um, kind of build up their social network that mostly retweeted things, retweeted the same things as a display account, but slightly rewarded or even retweeted them. And what this Twitter account essentially did was in quick succession, um, over a period of like one, one or two weeks, tweeted a bunch of links from this URL shortener for various purposes, for, to various um, articles and online, uh, blogs online. And they also had their, actually a blogspot website with like one article uh, to kind of, um, kind of expand the network, I guess. One of the activities that 2009 Iran Free and the um, other, other stock puppets were doing was they were kind of trying to spread the same IP addresses as proxies to Iranians to use as counter censorship. So for example, you can see that they have a list of IP addresses here that, uh, with the hashtag Iran election that they can use for protests. And they, and they might sometimes tweet links to, that, to, this, to those proxies using that URL shortener. And this is, this is quite concerning because one, one of the tools used by JTRIG is also codenamed code um, Molten Magma, which is basically a HTTP proxy to, with the ability to log all traffic and perform HTTPS span in the middle. Because again, they were, they were spreading exactly the same IP address. All of these, all of these puppet accounts were spreading exactly the same IP addresses and same links to, to Iranians to help them to, um, or to allegedly help them to evade counter censorship. And they were even claiming that these were the same proxies used by the Iranian government to get around their own firewalls. So if they apparently, if they block these proxies, they will block their own access to the outside world. And this is essentially what they're doing here. In this kind of context, GCHQ is kind of acting like the big bad wolf from Red Riding Hood. They might seem like they're helping you, but they're also causing you harm in the process. 
And one, this, is a, this is a list that contains um, a list of some of the techniques that JTrig use. Uh, this was a, also a leaked document. And this essentially kills Superbase in one sense, because what they do is, uh, at the bottom it says, one of the techniques is hosting targets online communications for collecting signal intelligence, as we saw with Poke, and which is why they tweet these links using the URL shortener so that they can conduct signal intelligence on people who are interested in clicking these links, and also providing online access to unsensitive materials, and sens sending instant messages to specific individuals, giving them instructions for accessing unsensitive websites. One of the forums that th these proxies were posted in uh, was whywepersonist.net, and someone actually kind of almost got it right. Someone asked, why does the government use proxies? That doesn't make any sense. They wouldn't need any proxies. And then someone replied, the Iranian government allegedly has set up proxies to monitor connections with, from within Iran to be able to pinpoint the people who are trying to bypass these blocks. So they're almost right, because it wasn't the Iranian government that was actually monitoring connections with Iran. It was GCHQ. They would also set up um, like really basic websites that basically acted as RSS feeds uh, to English websites uh, about Iran, presumably for also, also for counter-censorship reasons. One of the strange things they did was mimic government officials. So, for example, they might post on forums saying, attention users, users outside Iran, you can call the president at this number to discuss the elections direct. And they were hesitant that you should not call this number if you are in Iran. And then they will also give um, an email address for the vice president on the Twitter. This is, uh, also matches up with another uh, technique that JTRIC uses, again, according to their leaked documents, uh, where they send spoof emails and text messages from a fake person or mimicking a real person to discredit, promote distrust, dissuade, deceive, deter, delay, or disrupt. Whatever the purpose was, it certainly managed to promote distrust, because one of the replies to this post was, um, this can't be the president's number, because if it were, the second, the second the call will be answered by Iranian intelligence services. Still, these are strange days. I suppose anything could happen at this point. So that was most of the activity that we saw in 2009. There was, there was a bunch of other Twitter accounts um, with default egg, uh, default avatars associated with these links. You can find them if you search lyl.me with quotation marks on Google with site-twitter.com. Uh, in 2010, there was absolutely no activity on Twitter or other social media um, associated with this URL shortener. Then in 2011, we saw some activity in Syria for this URL shortener for a similar um, purpose of conducting censorship resistance in Syria. And they were essentially doing the same thing, same techniques, um, giving people IP addresses to connect to that they would, that, that are probably MIT M'd. But one of the interesting things they did here as well is they didn't just tweet stuff, they also posted a YouTube video, like a very poorly made YouTube video with only 300 views, um, to try to get people to watch that. Now, they didn't really try very hard here, because if you actually look at the times on, on, on one of these accounts tweeted, all of the accounts in Syria, um, associated with Syria tweeted, they only tweeted between 9 to 5 p.m. UK time, Monday to Friday. I mean, I think, I, I don't know, I think they were lazy or they, weren't just, they just weren't really bothered or motivated, but one of the limitations that JTRIG has, they actually had one, in the leaked documents that they had was they had a list of limitations that these, the staff have when conducting those operations. And one of them is that they have difficulty in maintaining more than a small number of, of unique multi-dimensional active, active aliases, especially when with doing online human intelligence, which is we, why we only see like one main Twitter account for, for these events, and then like a bunch of other kind of default X Twitter accounts, usually like five or six. We don't tend to see hundreds of them, we only see about less than 10, because, they're not do, because this was back in 2009, 2011, and they weren't doing it in an automated way. And they also said that the lack of continuity in maintaining an alias or communicating via an alias if a staff member is away uh, and his or her work is covered by others. 
And also the other one was lack of photographs, visual images of analysis, which is why we always see like egg or default avatars for these sub puppet accounts, because they can't, unless they have like a full-fledged graphics team or have faces of people to put on there, then they, they, really, they can't really put anything as an avatar. Um, they also apparently had lack of sufficient number and varied cultural language advisors, e.g. in Russian, Arabic, and Pashto, which is why we see here on these Twitter accounts, they're basically tweeting the same thing over and over again with no variation, exactly the same text over and over again, because they don't have lots of translators to translate that. Um, the other thing we saw in 2011 was a very targeted attack uh, during the Bahrain protests. Uh, they had a Twitter account called Freedom for Bahrain, and they, it just sent two tweets mentioning two Twitter accounts, 14 Feb TV and 14 Feb Revolution. And these were Twitter accounts that were uh, like really big kind of social uh, media outlets in Bahrain that were covering um, the protests that were going on there. And these were targeted mentions of the kind that we saw with Poke. So presumably also here they were using that to conduct signal intelligence to discover who was running these, running these Twitter accounts. In 2012, we also saw no activity associated with the Shiawa Then in 2013, I managed to find one tweet uh, related to Kenya, to the Kenyan pol uh, presidential politics. And this person isn't a GCHU sock puppet. This person is a research assistant at Human Rights Watch. So this, but that begs the question of how did you actually get this URL? Probably a similar method to Perk. They probably sent him a link through a private message, found that interesting, and tweeted it. So not only are they, find, not only are they targeting um, protesters, they're also targeting, targeting NGOs. Then in 2013, all of the infrastructure associated with the URL shortener was, was, was shut offline. This was in November 2013, which was a few months after the Edward Snowden leaks. So they had a bit of, de of delay of doing it, but it must have been a real pain in, in the ass for them to have to renew all their infrastructure. But I did do some digging into some of the other host names um, that were hosted on this LURL.me server between 2009 and 2013. Most of these host names seem to be like random alphanumeric um, domain names, and some of them are uh, using f public DNS providers like DynDNS or DNS alias. I wasn't able to find any websites archived for these domains, so it didn't seem that there was any websites there. But if you have any ideas, let me know, because one of the things that I suspect is that they could, they, these might have been malware endpoints or command and control servers that they were using. So if you have any... Um, monitoring tools or logs, then maybe you should look up some of these host names. But one of the interesting domain names that I thought was interesting there was dunesadventures.net. And this is the archived um, page for Dunes Adventures, which was another website based in Kenya. They were up to something in Kenya. And it claimed that they were having, this was a very basic one-page website that was kind of very poorly made. And they claim that they were having site problems, and apparently we have noticed problems with our booking system. This has been taken offline until text find our problem. We apologize for inconvenience. But there was never any booking system in the first place. This was just pretty much a ruse to make it look like if you go to this website, a legitimate company was hosting there. So if you um, might know anything about that, then I'd be curious as well. And also, if there's any GCHU agents in the room, um, then I'm happy to get a drink with you as well. Um, that's all I have for today. Does anyone have any questions? into trusting you and leaking any form of infos used everywhere right now. IRC, Twitter, Facebook, and so on. How would you advise people to distinguish between a genuine identity and an undercover agent? I think that's a very good question because... So, so just, just okay, a quick sorry. second. Sure. 
If you really have to leave the room right now, people, please do so quietly. We still have a talk going on and it's really unrespectful if you make that much noise and interrupt this whole thing. I know a lot of people are interested in the talk afterwards, but we'll all get you in and... Sorry. So I think that was a very good question because if you're conducting, if you're doing activism online and you need to be anonymous and you don't want to meet up with people in person, then how do you know that the people you're communicating with, or if you're like in a public group where you potentially accept new members to, into that group, how, can you, how do you know or kind of differentiate between who's actually there to harm your group or who's actually there to contribute? And I think the answer there lies in um, what you share. Don't share information that could with anyone that could potentially put you at harm, even with people that you trust. So essentially, you don't trust anyone, and this is a basic OPSEC rule. And this is how Jeremy Hammond um, messed up um, a few years ago, because when the FBI caught him because he was revealing too, too much information about his life, uh, like where, where he eats or something like that, or um, his previous drug, drug records. And they were able to use that to kind of figure out who he was. And that was the same mistake that Perk made. He was too open and friendly to that agent for no reason. So I think the kind of answer is to do your operations in a way where you don't have to trust people. All right, so thank you. Uh, how effective do you think these methods are? Because we've seen the number of followers on Twitter and the number of views on YouTube were very low. So. How, how much people can, is affected by this kind of uh, operations? Yeah, so there was also a, a slide that I wanted to put in there that there was a leaked uh, page, or another leaked page from GTHQ that had a list of bullet points on what they consider to be an effective operation. And some of those bullet points include how many people click that link, um, how, many people, how many people watch a YouTube video, et cetera. So it's pretty much the same ways that you would measure it, how many people view a specific message. Now, in those specific use cases, I don't think they were very successful on a large scale, specifically in Iran protests, because their Twitter accounts only had very few followers, and their YouTube videos only had a few hundred um, views. But they might have been more, they were obviously more successful in more targeted cases when they're targeting specific individuals, like during the Bahrain case or the Boat case. Over there, please. Sure, thank you. Uh, so I was just curious if you were uh, familiar with the, the work of Erin Gallagher. Uh, she's done work to try to figure out kind of quantitatively and make these visualizations to try to figure out if a particular Twitter account, for example, is a bot or whether it's a person. And there's some, you know, rules of thumb regarding like, you know, the bots just kind of interact with each other and don't react, don't interact with real people. I'm just curious what, uh, uh, what techniques you may know of to, to figure out, um, you know, what is a bot and what is not and whether you are familiar with those particular lines of uh, research. Uh, I'm not familiar with, with their work, but thank you, I'll check it out. Um, in terms of what kind of metrics that you could use or uh, to use to, to, to see if an account is valid or not, I mean, I think, I guess, their, t their tweeting kind of habits, and when they tweet, for example, it could be indicative. So for example, we saw this person only tweeted 95, although obviously that's quite easy to make it so that, that it's not the case. Um, also, I think one useful thing that might be, might be interesting to do is try to map the network of these accounts. If you like, build up like a tr uh, web of, of followers, then you might be able to very easily graphically detect uh, very obvious clusters of accounts that are following each other to be, to be each other's signal. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Right, let's uh, switch over to mic six, please. Thank you for the, thank you for the great talk. Um, how would you compare the uh, former British activities to the current Russian activities? Uh, maybe a talk in itself, but... To be honest, I haven't been uh, digging too, too deep into the details or following too much about the Russian activities, so I can't really comment about that. I don't know how prolific it is. I only mentioned it brief briefly in the beginning of the slides because it was uh, to give some context. So I'll have to research more into the, the Russian activities. Go to Mike Five again. Thanks. Um, to to continue from um, the, the person who spoke, um, that would have been my question. 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 So just to uh, add up onto that, did you stumble up on similar patterns 
coming from, say, uh, Canberra or uh, Washington, D.C.? So these accounts were very were specific to, just to the U.K. expressions. There was no kind of collaboration there with other countries within the Five Eyes, like the U.S. and Australia. Uh, but I think they might have collaborated. GCHQ, I think, has collaborated before on the NSA. Um, JTRIG specifically, I think, has collaborated before with the NSA to de certain people. So, for example, um, we saw during um, a few years ago, or last year, I think, uh, there was a drone attack. Uh, someone was illegally killed in a drone, a drone strike in Iraq. He was uh, suspected to be an ISIS member, Junaid Hussein. And apparently, the way that he was de or how, the way they found his location, is that the US, uh, the FBI specifically, had an informant that was talking to this person, and that informant sent them a, sent them a link that was generated by GCHQ, and then through that link, they were able to de them. So I think there's some collaboration there, but this is mostly UK activity. Our last question, we are out of time. Thank you again, uh, Mustafa.